in our last video, we learned how to sample from a finite population. Now let's learn how we can sample from an infinite population. We can define a target population. That's our population of interest. However, it's quite possible that our population of interest contains people, subjects, elements that keep changing over time, where our population is never static. There are constant changes. What we can do is sample the group that exists right now, and we will assume that what we learned from that sample will tell us not only about this population as it exists, but also future populations. What would be examples of an infinite population? The hospital patients in an ICU at this time. The inventory at the Amazon warehouse. Is that constantly changing? New things coming in and going out? The cars coming off an assembly line. Yes, we're making the same kinds of cars, but the cars right now will be sold. A new set of cars will be coming on. If we want to know something about this population of cars and their gas mileage, we can still sample this population, but it's an infinite population, so we hopefully will be able to tell not only the cars that are, have already been created on the assembly line, but the ones that we're going to make uh, next week, next month, or even next year. The customer support calls to a help desk. The sampled population changes each time. That's what makes this an infinite population. It's like stepping into the same river twice. The river is constantly changing. We might think of it as the same river, but it's different than it was before. With an infinite population, we have similarities, the population now versus the population a month from now, but we can't ever totally sample or totally measure the entire population. We never really know everything that we want to know about a population. The, the mean, the standard deviation, the range, all the characteristics of that population to us are unknown. That's why we're using sampling. What we then tend to do is draw a sample from this population, and we measure what we want to know. Let's say it's the mean. We get a mean of 5.3 for this first example. Then we draw a second sample. We get a mean of 4.8. A third sample gives us a mean of 5.1. So which of these means is the best, most representative mean for the population? And what we're going to do is instead of choosing just one of these means to represent our population value, we're going to take all of these means and we're going to average them. Then what we will be able to do is create a point estimate, a single number that combines to represent the population mean. Later on, I'm going to show you how we can also create a range of values in which our population mean would fall roughly 95% of the time. So we can create a point estimate, a single number, and the, the trade-off is the specificity of that one number is probably going to be wrong. It'll, the, the actual population mean will be close to our point estimate, but not exact. Whereas we create a range of scores, and that range is going to be right 95% of the time, the mean will be within that range, but we don't have a specific value to go off of. So we can trade specificity for accuracy when we're estimating with a point estimate, which is specific, versus a range of scores, which is more accurate. Now, I did something on purpose that's actually a, a mistake. This would actually make it more difficult. Do you see the difference in the sizes of those circles where one is smaller, one is much larger? That's like sample size. When we have different sample sizes, we would then have to weight the mean because larger samples are going to exert more leverage on our, our estimate for the population. So what we can do when we do our sampling is make sure that we always get the same sample size. That is going to allow us to create a distribution of all of these sample means. Not simply averaging them, but getting a distribution of how those means shape up for all of the possible combinations of 30 or 50 or 100 subjects from the population. Point estimation uses statistics 
from the sample to estimate the population parameter. And in this case, it's, a, it's really a form of statistical inference. We're taking what we learned from the sample and inferring that that is what is true of the population. Point estimators look like these. We have x bar for the mean. The population value is mu. For standard deviation, we'll abbreviate that as SD. You'll also see it abbreviated as lowercase s. The population value is sigma. For proportions, which we're going to learn about next week, the point estimator is P bar, and the population value for a proportion is P. What distinguishes an infinite from a finite population? There's some things that we can look for. With an infinite population, there's no upper limit to the number of units, the number of patients in the ICU, uh, the number of items that are in the warehouse. Therefore, we can't create a frame of the population because we can't create a list of everyone who could possibly be in the ICU. It's continually changing. We cannot list all of the elements in the population and so we can't use random number selection, especially on people who are either not yet in the population, but will be if they keep eating uh, hamburgers, uh, or people who are, were in the population but have uh, healed up and moved on and are no longer in the population. So to illustrate the infinite population, we're going to use sampling week 11 with the ICU data tab. The ICU data, is a list of 4,194 cases, which we are going to treat as our population. A hospital administrator has collected data on patient admissions and length of stay, as well as some other variables like age and whether or not the individual expired or died. We're going to use the RAND function to randomly select 30 cases. We'll compute the mean and standard deviation for the length of stay. And later, next week, we'll learn how to compute a proportion for those who expired. So here we are in our Excel spreadsheet. We're on the tab for ICU data. We have our length of stay listed in column E. And we have a place to put our random function. So that is where we're going to begin. So we will go to G2, and we'll type equal sign, R-A-N-D, open parentheses, close parentheses. And that creates a, a number between 0 and 1. Now, rather than trying to drag this all the way down to the bottom of 4,000 cases, we're going to use that double-click trick, and it will help speed up this process. So we will select cell G2. In that lower right corner, we see the little box, double click. Now, the random numbers have been copied to the end of the list. We can now sort the data to pull a random 30 cases to the top of our data set. So go to data, sort, and then in the sort box, sort by the random column, sort on values, and we'll keep it with smallest to largest and click OK. We now have our cases reordered based on the random number. Now you'll notice I've created a box out here to the right with the blue and the green. It contains some useful information. We would not typically know the parameters of the population, in other words, the mean and standard deviation of the population, we would not necessarily know those values, but in this case, we've been able to, to look into the great beyond and, and actually know those numbers. So essentially what I did was I ran a mean and standard deviation on the actual population. That's gonna be useful so we can make some comparisons. So we wouldn't know this, but in this example, we have some insight that we wouldn't typically have. Let me show you one little trick that I've discovered that is kind of nice for quickly summarizing a set of data. Uh, we're, we're interested in length of stay. So put your cursor in cell E2 and just uh, drag down and select the first 30 cases. And what you will notice is in this bar along the bottom of the table, you will see the count of 30 along with the average, 
which is computed, and it will be different for what you see with your data, because your data have been randomized differently than mine, but you will get a mean of those 30 cases. It just appears automatically. You also get the sum of those 30 cases. This can be a quick, easy way to calculate some simple descriptive statistics just by hovering over those numbers. What you will notice in the blue and green box is that I've set up a formula which will calculate the mean, the standard deviation, and the proportion of those who expired. Anytime you resort the data, those numbers will change, but it will always be based on the first 30 cases. If we wanted to get a second sample, it's as simple as resorting the data. That brings a fresh new 30 cases to the top. The numbers in the blue box will change. So here's how we're doing sampling. We are randomly sampling a sample size of 30 from an infinite population. This will allow us to make some comparisons between the sample statistics and the population parameters. When we do not know the population parameters, we'll use the sample statistic to estimate them. But in this case, we actually know those population parameters only because I'm using it for this teaching example. Your results will yield different point estimators than mine because your results have been randomized differently than mine. But they will be close to those parameter values. So now that we've done this experiment, we're going to take this to the next step of creating estimators for our population.